Uh, thanks, uh, Murray and Vladimir, for asking me to talk. Um, it's awesome to uh, be able to connect with um, the folks in in Australia and New Zealand that uh, that I got to hang out with last year. Um, at some point, uh, international travel may be something that humans can do, and I, I look forward to getting down there again. Um, so, uh, yeah, I wanted to kind of share. Um, lessons that uh, I've learned. Um, and uh, mainly, I wanted to kind of focus on security, performance, and workflow. Like, uh, those are all um, kind of sessions onto themselves. Uh, so um, like when I create um, presentations, they turn in, they, they go through a process of being five different presentations. And at one point, it was all about nothing but Google. And then I realized no one really wanted to hear about just Google. But uh, so I sort of uh, rearranged everything. And I sort of have it at, a, at a, something that I hope will be useful for people kind of all at all levels. Um, so I, I work at Pantheon. Um, I've been with Pantheon for a while. Uh, I don't really know how to do anything else at this point. Um, uh, Pantheon is a platform for Drupal and WordPress. We've been around since around 2010. Uh, we run a bunch of sites on the platform. Um, in addition to that, we kind of think of ourselves as a platform as a service. In addition to just running all of our infrastructures, uh, we also have code pipelines. We have the dashboards. We have a bunch of services that you know, do everything from um, manage authentication to handle our API and our uh, edge layer routing and making sure backups are all working and that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, I, I ran customer success, which for us is support, onboarding, training, documentation, pretty much anything post-sale. Um, I moved to uh, Japan about four years ago, and now um, I do everything pre-sale, uh, post-sale, and um, in the middle of the sale uh, for um, folks in Australia and New Zealand and APAC. Um, and I live here in Tokyo, in um, in Shibuya. So, again, at some point when um, we can all leave our homes, and if any of you ever make it up here to Tokyo, uh, I'll take you to the the good ramen places. Let me know if you're ever up here. Um, cool. So, uh, like I said, uh, uh, I searched through our support ticket um, system. And I looked at like the top categories of what people were asking about uh, in general, and um, these three kind of came up as uh, you know by far sort of the most requested kind of issues that came in, and uh, and I want to kind of talk uh, skewed towards like the last few years about uh, what, how we think about security and kind of what we're seeing uh, about security and performance, and. Um, spend a little bit of time on workflow. There's not really too much there, except for my subliminal message that's appearing on some of these slides uh, to recommend using continuous delivery. So um, so let's get started with security, because there's a lot to cover. Um, so uh, just to set the stage, um, like Pantheon, like I lose a lot of sleep thinking about security. Um, we, uh, we know that. Uh, that websites and web applications are the main target for hackers uh, to try and infiltrate um, companies and get their data. And um, as much as I'd love to say that uh, our hardcore uh, super tight security prevents that, uh, most of the time when people come in uh, or break into a website, it has nothing to do with um, you know, kernel exploits or backdoors or anything like that. Like as as this um, study shows, like eighty percent of um, all hacking that occurs uh, generally happens through the use of um, credentials being stolen or through brute force, through uh, password packing and things like that. Um, so as much as uh, you know, you can kind of keep the that's kind of one of the overarching messages like you can keep your infrastructure super secure but um it's really only kind of secure as the weakest link which a lot of time has to do with a lot of human factors as well um and like when we look at the trends in um in uh data breaches over time uh, we see that hacking, of course, which is you know through the use of passwords or backdoors or exploits, that's the top one. 
um, but uh, uh, social engineering is the number two. And um, interestingly enough, the one in the middle there that's increasing um, steadily is error, which um, is generally defined as like misconfiguring pages or misconfiguring settings or something that just allows access uh, to um, bad actors or just to the public in general. Um, and that's something that we also see kind of steadily increasing on our platform. And um, generally, like the top reason there is um, server misconfiguration or application misconfiguration, permissions um, being set uh, incorrectly or too loosely. Um, Mr. Misdelivery there, number two, is obviously like sending the password to the wrong people or um, letting credentials kind of get um, get released uh, uh, accidentally or mistakenly. Um, and the bad news is, is if you look at the, the data on the right, you'll see that um, most of the time, unfortunately, it's not the company that finds out. Uh, it's, it's actually number four. Uh, at about, I guess that's like 8% there. Uh, uh, often it's found by security researchers, by third parties, um, and a lot of people just don't even know that they have um, left data open to the public until um, someone else tells them, which um, can be a uh, the beginning of a very bad day for someone in um, DevOps or in system administration. And so, um, so I asked uh, our director of InfoSec, uh, Gary, um, what uh, he wanted me to tell the uh, Drupal meetup about um, what he's learned in the last five years. And he put it uh, thusly um, that no matter what he does, the bad guys continue to drive through the front door. And uh, he said it in the um, requisite uh, resigned um, frustration and uh, desperation of a uh, director of InfoSec there. So, um, you know, his, his, uh, his answer to solve that problem and um, mine too is, uh, is the second line here, which is multi-factor authentication. And um, what we've learned over time, like our engineers use it heavily, um, our system reliability engineers at this point I can't even get into servers early on for us. Um, if there was a problem, I could jump in. I could look at the logs if I need to, to you know, comment out code like it was easy for me to do. But like at this point, um, as we sort of had to harden our own security, um, like to get in, it's uh, it's monitored, it's logged. Um, we need uh, you know several different layers of authentication to get in, and generally um, the we we just don't do it period and we try and figure out other ways that are much more secure to do it so um i added the sydney drupal uh meetup part in there he didn't really say that but um i thought that might impress the uh the importance of the issue there a little bit further so so yeah multi-factor authentication um the second um one of the other consistent things that comes up uh, in the support queue for uh, in the support queue and in conversations with uh, with customers is also um, just general kind of um, concern about bots um, uh, confusing or um, the inability to kind of determine like what's a bot, what's a good bot, what's a um, denial of service. Um, or like what's really traffic, you know, just valid people coming to the site and what's a traffic spike. And, um, and uh, that's uh, something that we talk about a lot. And it's, it's hard because especially if you look at this chart, it's like bots are a good, you know, 37% of all traffic, good or bad. And a quarter of them are um, are doing something that you probably don't want them to be doing, and they're not necessarily trying to take down your site or hack it. But at this point, we see a lot of bots that are designed to really scrape uh, the data off of it for repurposing, for selling to you know other different platforms, um, you know, for um, for gathering information, uh, for business intelligence, um, and. Uh, you know, even in the case of Google, which, you know, can alternatively be a force for good and a force for not uh, so much good, like we see um, Google kind of looking at sites to see like how they perform. And then often if they feel like it 
a, a particular site isn't performing well, they'll just start, start you know, listing their, you know, better options in front of it, um, you know, as better uh, ranked results that sort of help their advertising model. And we kind of uh, see that a lot with zero click search results and things like that, where you see in the search page, it's actually returning results and sort of reducing the need to actually click through to the websites. So, um, you know, uh, we do see uh, an increasing number of bots that we sort of filter at our edge layer. And um, we understand that uh, in addition to bots, there's also real kind of DDoS attacks, which are growing as well, um, where you know, the object is to, the goal of the of the actor is to kind of limit access to the site. And, uh, you know, when you compare even just 2015 to 2019, um, the, the amount of DDoS attacks has increased significantly. Um, they're, they're not uh, as blunt force as they used to be as well, where they target specific companies, they target specific sectors, they um, they are looking for different things, not just to take down a site, but more and more they're um, asking for uh, ransom and asking for money uh, to um, to kind of uh, to stop attacking sites or at least threatening to do so. And so um, we sort of uh, work with these a lot. Um, again, like CDNs, generally uh, the 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 answer to the the problem is generally like CDNs do a pretty good job of handling these. And I think like for a, a lot of um, a lot of smaller websites and smaller companies, like the general thought is that like, well, I'm too small to be a target. But over time, like the actors are not like the people that are doing these things are not not, not necessarily looking to take down your specific site or if they're uh, sending botnets to hit your site. It's not necessarily because they want your data, but it's because if they're trying to hack, like, um, like the chart on the right says, like, number one is they're looking for financial returns or some kind of financial motive is in there. The number two reason that actors are involved in hacking or uh, malicious bot attacks is really for other purposes. Like they're trying to get gather information to use elsewhere. And so, um, like we see it all the time. We see it um, with uh, uh, attacking, you know, organizations to get to other organizations that are affiliated. Uh, we see it attacking agencies that are looking to like, you know, people who execute these attacks also understand that, you know, agencies build sites for many different people. And if they can get access to one, they might be able to get access to others. So uh, like, there's a lot more triangulation that goes on and, um, and like we see, like in this case, you know, in these sort of case studies, like even during the pandemic, like there's very sort of targeted attacks to limit access to information, um, to limit access to food delivery um, and other things. So uh, like we continue to see like growing um, urgency, uh, uh, complexity, and uh, confidence in, in the way that these are attacked and so, or executed. Um, and so um, like a bunch of these things have probably, you know, a bunch of these, you know, tips have been shared uh, for years, uh, but um, having a CDN with a, with a web application firewall, which generally has a set of rules that can be updated, or uh, you could subscribe to lists, which allow, um, you to uh, pull in new rules and doesn't put the onus on you as maybe someone who runs the site themselves or as a developer who's trying to build a site and um, you know add features and that kind of thing to be able to uh, just sort of depend on the intelligence of like the infosec community and be able to pull in rules with like a you know a smarter web application firewall or something like that. Um, keeping core up to date obviously is important. I say that now, like obviously, like I shouldn't say obviously, like on our platform, because we have an edge layer, we're able to deploy, um, you know, fixes at our edge to mitigate things like, uh, Army, uh, you know, Drupal Geddon and Drupal Geddon 2 and things like that. But um, the brutal truth is, is that we put those um, fixes at our edge layer at the same time we tell people to up update the modules. Um, or update core, um, and 
generally, even 30 days after, we'll see that um, one out of four sites has not done that. And we have to take extra human intervention because even if our, and because what we see is that, you know, our um, mitigations will work, but the hackers will continue to try different scripts and get around the filters that we put in place and that kind of thing. So like um, having an awareness, again, that's why I kind of hinted like continuous delivery, like keeping your core up, uh, core up to date, keeping modules up to date. Um, I, I, um, I know I sound like a broken record compared to, you know, typical kind of best practices, but it is kind of important. Um, locking uh, production down also is one of the, um, things that initially, like it's a turnoff for people who use our platform because like you can't SSH in, um, but it also means that like for us, we don't have to deal with, you know, especially like in the WordPress world, like it's such a common thing, like cowboy coding is probably more associated with like WordPress developers than Drupal people. But like, it was such a common thing to be able to just like, you know, push, you know, SSH in or FTP files in and things like that. and. Um, like that's at this point in time, like continuous delivery allows for um, secure uh, deployment of code via version control. So no one really is logging into um, into the production environment and you can lock things down in a, in a really kind of strong way that kind of prevents the exploits that can happen. Um, yeah, and then CAPTCHA and HTTPS. HTTPS, I'll talk a little bit um, more about. Um, so yeah, so uh, like for us, we've had to grow uh, and build out the processes. Uh, some were things we just needed to do as we grew anyway, needed to do anyway, but some were also things that we needed for compliance, for like SOC 2 com um, compliance and things like that to actually build out the processes to run drills and sort of just build a culture around security. Um, the defense in depth, like I said, there's more than these. Uh, layers, but permissions in production, like locking that down, CDN for like multiple reasons, including performance, and then like multi-factor authentication, generally using like time-based one-time passwords um, and using smart kind of authentication um, is uh, recommended. And then like I sort of alluded to before, like if you assume that, um, you know, they know people know what they're doing, and uh, they don't have your best intentions in mind, and they know how to Google, and they do how they do know how to do sort of the research to kind of triangulate how to get access to a site. I think like most of the time um, when we see intrusions, it's from a uh, you know maybe from an agency that is growing and they're get you know their first government customer or their first like customer that's like a potential like political target or something like that, and so. Uh, as you grow, like your problems change and kind of morph. And uh, we've had to learn that in, in a lot of different ways in terms of scaling and uh, infrastructure and support and, you know, um, but security especially. Um, that being said, like the tools that I just mentioned, Drupal, luckily, Drupal handles a ton of that. You know, Drupal gets you super far. The right tools get you even further. And then best practice get, get you pretty far. And generally, like, you, even in this day and age with, like, the, um, the, uh, the diagrams that I showed about the DDoS, um, DDoSs and things like that, you should be able to work pretty productively and kind of in an agile fashion. So that's my... Uh, my screed on on security. Um, so performance, uh, like in support, that's where I've spent a lot of my time. And um, over the years, um, one of, you know, it's a couple different conversations. Like I talk to developers all the time, um, but I also talk to stakeholders a lot. And stakeholders, you know, security and performance fall into the category of like, unless it's bad, it's not an issue. Like you only think about it when it's going poorly, you know? And so um, for us, like during onboarding for a new customer, like it, it got to be pretty important for us to make the case for, uh, for performance. And um, part of doing that was understanding what their goals are. And then also having KPIs that sort of validate um, 
the benefits of performance. Um, and a couple of the KPIs that I wanted to kind of talk about next um, sort of tie into uh, part of my Google conversation, uh, which are time to first bite, um, time to first paint, and then just like overall um, page load. Um, and it's basically like a balance of finding like the balance between like adding features and things like that and uh, being able to have a site that still performs, you know, and often what we see are kind of a death by a thousand cuts. And um, so generally when we work with customers, we kind of bifurcate performance into two, uh, two parts. Like one is the time to first bite and then the rest is everything that comes after that. And uh, we do that because like time to first bite over the years has been kind of an important uh, measurement because it was correlated to how um, Google indexes uh, search results. And that's, it's like, it's not necessarily the factor that it, that it used to be, but um, I kind of like recommend thinking about it more like a binary factor. Like it has, if, if it's good enough, Google doesn't mess with you, but if it's terrible, it's probably going to be a problem because it's still somewhat correlated, but um, but I think it's probably uh, not as highly weighted as it used to be. Um, and we do see that, uh, you know, aside from time to first bite, we see that um, conversion rate also slips the longer time it takes for a page to load. Um, I think a lot of these stats have been sort of thrown around for a long time. And so I don't think that there are anything um, super um, new to anybody. And the same thing goes with, with bounce rate. Um, you see bounce rate increasing exponentially as, um, or linearly rather, as the uh, page load time increases. And so like what these factors all kind of lead to is that, um, especially with analytics, uh, with Google Analytics and other analytics tools, you have this funnel, um, you know, a marketing funnel to achieve your goals, but you also have like a bounce rate to take into account and you have people that give up because the time to first bite is, is too long or Google is giving you a hit because time to first bite or time to first paint takes too long. So like you begin to have this top of the funnel like above the top of the funnel customers that you never even see. And so a lot of times when we're talking about performance, we see this actually the uh, like this weird phenomenon occur where performance gets so bad that only the most dedicated um, viewers stick around. And so like your overall engagement actually goes up because your um, your your analytics aren't capturing sort of the people that just get lost because a because it's not ranked as highly as it could because of low time to first bite, but also like time to first paint, paint and other factors that have to do with um, you know sort of accepted kind of user perception. Like they're so bad that people jump off, and so like we sort of paint the picture of like you should correlate conversions and sort of do the financial data to kind of calculate like how much performance will help you, but also think about like this unseen kind of segment of users that may never actually even get to your site because of performance. And so, um, you know, like I mentioned with time to first bite sort of uh, falling in favor uh, with Google and uh, what they have sort of gone towards is Lighthouse and uh, Lighthouse like I'm sure a lot of people know, like it's available in Chrome, um, but also, uh, you know, uh, it it's it can be included in your CI and you can add it to um, to your process, and that's kind of like part of where I want to make the case for uh, continuous integration because you can be measuring this stuff as you go, and so the general goal is to kind of reduce the um, the time to first bite without giving up. Um, you know, HTTPS and things like that. Um, so uh, let me skip ahead a little bit because I want to kind of cover everything and I'm getting a little bit behind. Like I said, I make these too long. So generally, like with HTTPS now, as that's improving, like an old stack versus a new stack makes a difference because um, in terms of generally with round trips and while some of these, uh, you know, these round trips here, was my pointer? Some of these are kind of gradually getting solved um, 
making sure that you have like a new stack and making sure that you're using a CDN that has a new stack is pretty important because like overall we're trying to reduce the amount of round trips. And like if we had an old stack, you're looking at eight round trips over HTTPS, whereas new with newer ones, you're dealing with three. And you know, hopefully with HTTP three, you'd be looking at even less than that. That being said, using an HTTP, uh, using a CDN is even better for HTTPS because even like if it's set up correctly, even if you have to make round trips between um, the, the end user and the pop, like a lot of times between the pop and the origin, that could be one connection, one persistent connection. So CDN helps there too. Um, and like, and can greatly affect time to first byte, like within the continent, like within Australia, it makes the difference between 605 milliseconds and 250, where we actually see these, these like single digit time to first byte, uh, metrics. And then across continents, like you're never going to be able to hit your targets, um, without some kind of modern stack there. Um, so yeah. And so with, along with that, like caching your um like there's has generally generally initially it was kind of like at least cache your assets but i think at this point like being able to cache everything is super important because like after your time to first bite time to first paint is important and also with the new version of um of lighthouse it's like the largest object is becoming one of the more important factors in um in performance ranking and we see that the difference between the old, like an old stack with no CDN and no page caching versus one with a CDN and with page caching is much better. So um, that's this is kind of the second formula that we use uh, to kind of reduce um, the front end and the back end performance. And generally what we recommend is like find um, the metrics um, focus on mobile and uh, use Lighthouse and tools like that. Make sure you're compressing images. That's kind of like rebooting your router, like the thing you assume everyone's doing, but um, often that kind of fixes a lot of problems. And generally using um, like uh, using New Relic, like when we debug, we use New Relic, looking, being able to understand the logs and being able to deploy, like New Relic allows you to tag deploys where, where you can see kind of that death by a thousand cuts that kind of happens. Um, yeah, and so like New Relic or Datadog and things like that. Um, and then uh, like controversial opinions, like we have some agencies that just don't use views at all. Like uh, I love views. It's one of the reasons that I got into Drupal, but um, you know, it can create some pretty hairy queries. And I think at least like be aware that views can hurt your query, can hurt your performance and be able to know how to override queries, know how to like, we spend, a, we have a bunch of docs on like front end performance and we spend a lot of time working with customers to like, especially differentiate like what should be served like in the HTML page versus what should be um, outsourced uh, or should be served in like a separate file because that can also have a big effect. Um, when I ran it on one of my sites, obviously I ran the Google Lighthouse and Google was the perpetrator of all my blocked um, uh, interactions there. So it's both the your best friend and your worst enemy. And so finally with like workflow, um, just to sort of wrap up, like continuous integration, um, performance can be integrated to that super easily now. The cost of doing that and the complexity of doing that, um, along with adding load testing, maybe not for every deploy, but for big deploys, you can also build in load testing to continuous integration. Um, and like now more than ever with like Drupal 9, like it's much like if you were just learning, I don't know how you all feel about this, but if I was just learning Drupal 9 right now, now is like a really good time to learn it alongside with continuous integration. Like it works better, like not perfectly, but it, it works better with Composer. It solves a lot of problems with deployment, like the, you know, sort of the, um, being able to track configuration changes is is much easier. Um, so think about continuous integration, bundle it with multi-factor authentication. Don't forget an awesome um, CDN. And then finally, like make sure that performance KPIs are um, are something that are shared and used as a, like a um, as sort of the um, the uh, framework for how you push changes to your site. Um, so yeah, so that's that's all I got. Well, Scott, thank you, mate. I'll be really applause here. I'm sure everyone else is. Thank you. 
Hey, mate, that was uh, about three talks in one. You covered so much, uh, <laughs> so, so much ground there. Thank you so much for that. Sure, I'm sure, sure. I'm sure there are questions out there. So if anyone's got questions, please just unmute yourself and ask away. Uh, uh, not I not a question, I, but a comment. Um, I found that that point about the, like if their site performance is so bad that their SEO, like their, their initial funnel is so narrow that their engagement goes up, that is just, that's awesome. Like that, that's just such a, a cool little, um, you know, statistics line example. Yeah, you could always throw out like the silent majority, like they want to get to your site, but they just don't know where it is, you know. Uh, yeah, it is pretty, um, it is pretty amazing. I think it's gotten better over time. Um, and Google Analytics is better at capturing that. But, but yeah, like, especially it depends like where you put the pixel. And if it if the pixel gets there and fires, then a lot of times you're okay, but it doesn't always happen. And if it's at the bottom of the page, people might just give up, you know, beforehand. No questions is fine too. So, uh, I'll ask a question there, Scott. You quickly showed in the CI section um, sort of measuring performance. C can you just talk a little bit about that? Is that something that as, as a recipe that's built into what Pantheon's offering or that's something that, um, you know, developers will wire in themselves? Um, so we do measure it in a really blunt way. Um, like our CTO is also on the, um, the AMP steering committee that Google's AMP thing. And uh, so uh, he, he's a big fan of Lighthouse. Uh, I think it's also gotten much better. Like it used to be a pretty blunt instrument, but uh, we've adopted it more and more on our internal services, uh, like our dashboard and like our marketing site as well. Um, but it is something that we, we look at more uh, as something that's objective enough that it should be more customer facing. Um, but uh, as far as continuous integration, almost every customer that I bring on, like I almost try and slam them into it. Like if the like if they're migrating to us, like now is also a good time to like let's just go ahead and set this up for you because it is a you know maybe it is a pain to do normally, but while we're changing things, let's let's put that in now, and we can also like I can also like influence what gets in there, and so like that the lighthouse tool can like there's recipes to put it into circle to travis um so it, they've made it much easier uh than they used to to be able to do it um and you can run it like you can run it from like it's something that i like to do just when i'm checking out a site that i might be talking to the customer shortly is like you can run a single cli command that spins up a docker container does the thing prints out a report and you can just like sort of share like objective information so it's super useful I have a question about security education for the clients. So uh, the issue we found is, on average, it's quite easy to talk to majority of the clients. But you got this kind of like everywhere you have these two marginal things where one bit of the client who are pretty much rejecting anything, saying, oh, "Who cares if there is no, you know, HTTPS." So, and it doesn't matter if it can be moms and pop shops and can be quite a big sites that still don't run through HTTPS. On the other side, you have this forts basically sitting behind triple firewalls and VPNs not adopting to the latest technology and kind of locked down without any kind of specific reason for that. So how do you work with uh, those clients and trying to find a golden middle uh, in terms of security? Because even if they sit behind three firewalls, in a lot of cases, they have very bad bad internal practices and losing data by just posting it to a public bucket, for example. Yeah. Um, with So, yeah, I think that, um, you know, I was thinking about what was the case uh, not too long ago with uh, one of the Australian sites where uh, the government official said it's a DDoS, and then he came back later and he said, um, no, it's not a DDoS. It's just, it just like, it was just popular, you know? And I think like stakeholders 
have a much different way of um, understanding technology and develop that de than developers do. And so um, I think it's important to talk their language and like, like we, I'm pretty like brutal about it. Like if you ask, I ask a customer, um, like, is this a mission critical site? You know, so they have to make that choice. You know, if they tell me it's not mission critical, like I'll, you know, then I know, like I want them to tell me that it's mission critical because it probably is. They don't want to like make the commitment that goes along with having a mission critical site. But when you speak the language of like, oh, okay, it's a mission critical site. So here's what other people who have mission critical sites do. And here's how they, you know, protect against bad actors. And and the good thing is like point number two is that a lot of times like performance and security, like with a CDN, like they're both, they're the same thing. Like a CDN helps your security and it helps your performance. So it's like, it, there's two reasons that you use it. And hopefully like a lot of times security, you can build it into the conversation of like a modern stack has this for these reasons, you know, and then you're not just sort of in a defensive position about saying like, well, you know, well, I want the cheapest hosting that I can get, or I want to build the cheapest website I can get. And I'm like, well, what about security? Ah, eh, we haven't been hacked yet. Like, you want to avoid that and start from like, my position is like, I see sites get hacked all the time. Like I see, like, it can't be mission critical the day after it gets hacked. Like if you decide it's not mission critical, okay, you can live with that. Here's what we'll do. We'll set it up simply, but like more often than not, like they have to understand like the ramifications of like not treating the site like it, like it should be. I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense. That's, um, I see it a lot, especially, you know, um, with, uh, I think half the people get it, you know, people that have been around a while, they've been stung once. Um, they understand that like, it's something you kind of have to live with and you have to plan for it. But I think like, you know, like the charts that I show, like sometimes like I don't give people a choice of like, if they want to see a pre, if they want a price from me, they're going to hear about security. Like they don't have to choose it, but they at least have to hear about it, you know? Yep, thanks. Because uh, yeah, I thought we kind of went away from the conversation like, oh, Drupal is free, must be not secure. But lately I heard conversations like, oh, Let's Encrypt is free, so we don't really trust it. Yes. Things like that. Yeah. I Yeah. Um, we hear that uh, a lot, but I think like Drupal is such a, like Drupal is such a proven, like luckily, like here in Japan, um, it's a little bit of culture shock because I'm having I'm having to start over with like why open source is good, you know? Because like I'm competing against 50 CMSs that are, like have been built by Fujitsu, you know, and like it's their Fujitsu CMS, you know, and like you know why would you want that? Like it's everything, and they're like no no no, like they built it themselves, so it's never going to get hacked, you know. And so like it's sort of like the continuum of those kind of conversation. It's like you know. It's it's open source. That means it's good. Like you know, just like Apache, just like and you know, other tools that have been tr just like Linux. You know, it's the same kind of boat. So yeah, it's it's uh, it's a boring and often required conversation. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Sure about that. Hello, Scott. Margie here. Yeah, quick question. I have seen. When when a side Drupal site gets hacked, very often you 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 spend hours investigating, and then then you know the recommendation is you should really rebuild it and import you know like a last unhacked database and things like that. Now you as a platform owner, you must have tons of customers importing sites with you know questionable history into your platform. Like what what do you do? Like what's you know like do you have extra recipes for scanning? patterns? How do you protect yourself? Uh, yeah, so we have a bunch of kind of uh, inbound and outbound uh, performance or intrusion detection and sort of performance monitoring that um, that looks for those things. Um, and, um, you know, permissions go a long way. Like a lot of uh, exploits, especially in the WordPress world these days, like are more based on being able to, you know, the website being able to execute something. Um, and so permissions like stop eight out of 10 of those, you know, they'll see a theme or something that doesn't work 
like it should. And it turns out, well, it's because it's, you know, there's something in the footer that's trying to do something and like, oh, it's going to this .ru site. What, what a surprise, you know? And so, um, so yeah, I think like, we yeah, we do sort of um, check on it, but a lot of, uh, yeah, it's kind of a mix of uh, reporting and telemetry into the sites and, um, and just basic kind of, Linux stuff like it's at the expense of like the developers that want to be able to SSH in like we know people won't choose us because they can't do it. Um, but like, you know, the founders are a bunch of people who just don't want to deal with that. Like, you know, like early on, like my first day at Pantheon, I was like, you know, what if they need more RAM? And, and he was like, you know, Josh was like, we gave them enough RAM. I don't want to have a company where I'm asked that 20 times a day. So we give people a ton of RAM because I don't want to deal with it, you know? And that's kind of how we've approached some other things uh, there too, kind of along the same lines. I have a question here and I also type in the chat because I worry about my accent. So my question is, so we should try to persuade our client to uh, have the security update plan? Yes. Otherwise, after we be on the website and then have not the regular security update, then it's so dangerous. Okay. Yes. I like, um, I, it's like an opt in versus opt out strategy, I think is best. And I know that like for an agency, it's tough to do this a lot of times, but like security updates and a support plan that includes security updates and the CI that makes, makes doing that a painless process should be something that they cross off the invoice. Like you put it on there and you say, this is how we do it. If you don't want it, you can take it off, but this is how we do it. So at least you're starting the conversation like, we follow best practices. This is a best practice. Don't want to do it? Okay, you've opted out of best practices. Let's say that together out loud so we can continue, you know, like that kind of thing. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, so just be bossy or be stick to it. Just just be, yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Try it and let me know how it works. If you want me to back you up, I'm always there for you, Joan. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, anything else there before we wrap up on that one? Scott, that was really good. Amaji put in a comment. That talk is ready for DrupalCon. You prepared now? <laughs> awesome, perfect. <laughs> OK. Thank you so much. Let's do a little round of applause again. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, thank, thank you, you guys. Thank you, Scott.